Uh, I'm going to talk about two things today. So the first is some macro trends in TV viewing behavior, how consumers are changing, some of the, the things that we're seeing. And then a few of the challenges I think we, as an industry in programmatic, need to overcome to really help addressable TV start to scale. So the, the first thing to know, and I think we all feel this every day, is how fast consumer behavior is fragmenting. If you look at the average household in the U.S. right now, you're seeing about 10 devices per household. When you have four people in a U.S. household, that number of devices goes up to about 18. And so you have this massive problem as a marketer or an agency to say, how do I reach every person in the household across all the different devices that they might be using? How do I frequency cap across those devices? How do I know where to allocate money, what's working, what combination is, is really happening there? I think this is really interesting, too, which is I think sometimes we perceive addressable advertising, connected TV, OTT as a newer channel. It's not. From a consumer perspective, if you look at households in the U.S. that have broadband Internet, three out of four of them have connected TV. They're already watching it. You know, often you think about the adoption curve for new technology, early adopters, late adopters. If you look at the research analysts who are looking at the space, what they'll say is we're in the late mainstream phase of connected TV the vast majority of people who have internet are actually watching connected TVs and over-the-top television. I also think it's important to look at a macro level of, okay, if you just look at the total minutes that are spent watching TV in the U.S., how much of that is being streamed? So how much of that is coming through a connected TV, a smart TV, over-the-top? Right now it's about 8%. And, and the growth rate is pretty staggering. This is from the Wall Street Journal a little bit earlier this year where it grew 65% year over year. So basically it went from 5% in 2015 to 8% in 2016. That's, that's a huge jump in terms of absolute share that's taking from more traditional TV. Uh, and I think we're going to see that trend continue, if not accelerate even further. One of the reasons I think that's going to accelerate is that right now, every, every week you see an announcement about a new skinny bundle whether it's a cable operator, it's Hulu, it's Samsung, it's Verizon, it's Apple, it's Google. Everyone is in this race to say, hey, can I offer the consumer something that's $20, $30, $40 a month? It's some subset of what they're getting on cable today, and it's internet powered. If you look at most consumption today on uh, any kind of IPTV, you're really talking about Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, a lot of models that actually aren't ad supported. Most of these skinny bundles will be ad-supported along with the subscription fee. And so what I think that means is that when you go from 5% to 8% of total TV viewing being connected in a single year, this accelerates that. As more people move towards a cable package that's delivered over the Internet, I think you'll see an exponential increase in the amount of inventory that is actually connected. The Trade Desk, we're a global company, so we've got 11 off, uh, 21 offices in 11 countries. And one of our newest offices is in China, in Shanghai. And so we're constantly thinking about, okay, well, what's the right approach for the different channels we add to our platform in different markets? And in China, if you look at some of the e-marketer research, you actually see that connected TV has already surpassed linear. So they've already kind of gotten to an end state that the U.S. is racing towards. But we see this a lot throughout China, Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia in particular, where connected TV usage has already surpassed broadcast. And so that's where we're actually starting. There's not going to be much need for us to do work in broadcast in China. We'll skip straight towards connected. But overall, despite all the, the growth, I think we all feel it. We're all consuming content this way for the most part. So many U.S. households are doing this. It still feels like the spend hasn't followed, right? Uh, you know, for five, six years in a row, we talked about, is this the year of mobile? Is it here yet? Are we ready for the year of mobile? And then all of a sudden it happened. I think pretty driven by, by Facebook. My question is, what does it take to make, some, to make 2017 or 2018 the year of connected TV? What are the barriers that we still have to overcome to drive real spend? Because I'd argue we're mostly still in the test budget world. If you talk to most of the holding company agencies, they're spending in the kind of eight-figure range in connected TV, whereas overall TV is about half of the global advertising pie. So TV globally is a $300 billion advertising industry. And I think we're seeing way, way less than that just in test budgets. So I'm going to talk about a few of the challenges that I think we need to overcome. The first is scale. Um, you know, one of my favorite shows right now is The Americans. If you sit back and look at all the different ways you could watch The Americans, it's, it's pretty overwhelming. So you could stream it on FX. You could watch a video on demand. You could watch it on one of your various devices. You could watch it on Netflix for some seasons. 
But it's fairly fragmented, which is an experience I've often had. You're looking for the latest episode of this season. I try to log into the FX app. It's not authenticated. I have to go to my desktop, use that code on the connected TV. It's a kind of a painful, high-friction process for both the consumer and for the marketer who says, I want to reach the audience of the Americans, but I want to do so in a more cohesive way. This is a place where I'm optimistic. The thing that DSPs are best at is solving fragmentation. So if you look at what DSPs like the Trade Desk and DataZoo and MediaMath have done in every other part of uh, media buying is we've aggregated inventory. It could be tens of thousands of sites for display ads, video ads, native ads, audio. We're doing the same thing today in Connected TV. So we have clients on our platform who are buying on all these different devices that are internet connected and streaming TV, lots of apps, uh, different types of content to help solve that problem of how do I reach the, this consumer no matter where they might be watching the Americans. A bigger problem I think that we have right now is what I call the kind of the burden hand problem. And what I mean by that uh, is just that uh, TV networks have, they don't have a lot of incentive to change. Every year they sell the majority of their inventory at the upfronts or at the new fronts. They get uh, a decent CPM in general in the past year grew significantly over the previous year, so they're showing growth. No one in their organization is incentivizing them to change. Wall Street's not incentivizing them to change. If they grow 5 6% on a massive base, that's considered kind of good enough. And so one of the questions we have when we talk to the sell side, to programmers, to networks, to cable operators, is what number do we need to give them to move the needle, to drive them to make more inventory available? And so we're seeing two types of experimentation. One is, I think you'll see a lot of this this year at the upfronts and the new fronts, is some content owners and programmers saying, all right, we're going to do an upfront commitment, but we're going to allow some portion of that to be transacted programmatically or addressably. I think you're going to see a lot of the cable networks in particular start to move towards this model of saying, we'll let you bring your audience data and decide on 10, 15, 20% of the inventory. We'll give you more choice as long as we can maintain that overall commitment. The other thing we're seeing is, I think, borrowing a page from what's happening in programmatic right now with header bidding, which is letting all demand compete. I think probably the biggest change that happened in the past year in display and video buying in programmatic is the ability for header to open up more inventory. So now a lot of the direct sold inventory from a company like ESPN is competing with demand from programmatic, from ad networks, from everywhere else that typically got lower down on the waterfall. If you're a TV programmer, if you're a network, if you're a cable operator, what this means is if your TV team, if your sales team was that green bar, you direct sold for an $18 CPM, that's the new floor. So what can a programmatic bidder bring that's above that? In some cases, if it's a DSP bidding 15, you would decline that demand. But if you have a DSP offering a $25 CPM bid, $27, $30, willing to pay significantly more for that inventory, well, the conversations we've had with networks is that they're now open to this. They realize they're leaving some money on the table, and they're, they're weighing the trade-off of how much should I sell in the upfront versus how much do I make available in the scatter market or available in a more addressable way. Another challenge is the agency org chart. So uh, this is a great scene from Moneyball. If you've seen it, this is Brad Pitt is playing Billy Bean. He's the general manager of the Oakland Athletics baseball team. And here he's sitting, they're deciding what players to draft for the team. And all the guys to his left and right are the kind of the old school scouts. So they're all the kind of gut feel guys. He's the analytics, Excel spreadsheet driven guy to say, here's the stats we're going to use to draft certain players. And I, I think th this is kind of how the world sees transition sometimes, is in, in a movie, we think about it as, oh, it's binary. You're either old school or new school. You're either not data driven or you are. And too often I hear uh, people in, in media talk about, well, that's a legacy old school TV buyer. They know nothing about programmatic. Or the, the inverse is the programmatic buyer knows nothing about TV. And in a lot of agencies right now, there's a, a kind of a turf war happening between those two different teams. But in the good examples, some of the agencies we work with, we're seeing both sides come to the table. Because there's a lot of expertise that both sides need to share in order for programmatic TV to really take off. You know, Brian Lesser in the previous panel made a great comment, which, which is, it's not like Group M and other holding companies haven't been using data to buy TV. They have. There's lots of things they've done to say, what's the right program to buy? What's my cost per point? What's my guarantee? What's the right pricing? Some of the pricing expertise that we've seen from TV teams 
far outweighs what programmatic teams have. Not to mention relationships, being able to scale, things like that. Whereas digital buyers tend to bring in more of an understanding of how do I leverage the whole tech stack? How do I bring in the data management platform? How do I target an audience that is really fragmented right now? And, and typically, we also see them optimizing more. The average programmatic trader is optimizing every hour, every day, every week, not on a more quarterly or annual basis like TV tends to do because of how the upfronts are driven. And so we're seeing these teams come together to structure the upfront or new front deal. What audience should we buy? What audience should we guarantee? Where do we want addressability? Where do we want choice? I think that's part of the reason you're seeing some of the content owners and the networks willing to play ball at the new fronts. Another big challenge is measurement. Nielsen is still king, and I will be for a long time. This is my, one of my favorite TV, TV shows, The Wire. Uh, one of the episodes is titled, Come at the King, You Best Not Miss. I think that definitely applies to Nielsen. To some extent, you can't really measure GRP today when you're running on over the top and connected TV. We're actually working with Nielsen to try to change that, to show a marketer and an agency, here are the incremental GRPs that you can get when you're running on a Roku, when you're running on Hulu, when you're running on these different channels. That's how TV has been transacted for a long time. It's the currency with which you buy. You're buying 100 GRPs when you do an upfront. You need to be able to have an apples to apples comparison if you're going to see scale move into the connected space. We've got to be able to speak both languages, programmatic and the traditional GRP. If ever you had a doubt that Nielsen is here for the long haul, I think some of the news recently about Snapchat cements that, where Snapchat is basically saying, you know, we'll actually transact the same way that TV networks will. If you want to buy a guaranteed number of GRPs as measured on the Snapchat app, you can actually do that. It's, it's actually, in some cases, a simpler way to transact, right? You know you're getting that audience guaranteed to you, verified by Nielsen. But that's not to say it should be the only thing that we measure. So a lot of cases today, when we're running connected to TV, we have the agency trying to measure both GRPs and something else. So a secondary read might be offline business results. You know, one way to think about a Roku device or an Apple TV is they're just another device in the device graph. In the same way that companies like TapAd and Drawbridge can measure, is this the same customer on a mobile phone and a desktop computer? A Roku is just another column on that device graph, which means you can bring all that data that you're collecting to target and to report. So what we see clients doing is saying, I ran a campaign and connected TV. Is the person I showed an ad to, or are they now buying something online? Are they visiting somewhere in store that we can track on a mobile app? What other business result can we tie to, along with measuring the GRP side by side? Another challenge I think that has uh, stymied some of the adoption of Connected TV in the, in the earlier days has been arbitrage and transparency. You know, I think there are, sometimes what you see in the programmatic world is that uh, a, a company will buy inventory from a publisher, they'll add some data, and they'll mark it up. And they'll mark it up significantly before they sell it to the advertiser. And TV, we've seen this happen with some video DSPs, where they've gone to a network, they offer a $10 CPM, they then package it, offer to an advertiser and agency at a $20 CPM. And when the networks get wind of this, they're furious. They don't want to work this way. And the reason is, if you're ABC, NBC, any major content creator, if you, even if you're Netflix, you're spending billions of dollars to create content. They see this happen. They're saying, why is someone else other than me capturing the lion's share or some significant chunk of this revenue when they're not actually creating the value? In order for connected TV and advanced TV to scale, what we need is transparency. There has to be more transparency about the fees the different middlemen are taking. And that's something we've been talking a lot about with different networks. But this kind of model is the, the biggest thing that can set back the adoption of connected TV right now. And the last challenge I'll call out is we need to improve the consumer experience. And I'll, and I'll put an ominous or else. Uh, this experience of, again, trying to find that latest episode of The Americans is really frustrating. You know, I, I was doing this last week. I was trying to find the latest episode this season. And I, I couldn't, I was on the road. I, my cable company wouldn't let me log in on their app. It was really hard to just get to find this episode. It's hard for consumers to navigate a, a lot of these different apps and systems. And at the same time, when they do log in, when they do get access to the content, too often it's a subpar ad experience. You see this is ad one of five that's about to play, and you're kind of like, oh my god, I have to watch five ads, and they're telling me exactly how long it is. And then four of the five ads you see are the same ad repeated over and over again. And from the consumer point of view, you, you sit there thinking, 
isn't there technology to fix this? Do I have to see the same ad over and over again? Why are they showing this to me again and again in the same ad pod? How many people in this room right now use Cody? So we're in a, we're in a safe space. I know it's quasi-illegal, so I see two hands. Um, <laughs> this is the or else. So I think this is the potential problem. So if you don't know Cody, it's essentially the Napster of connected TV. So I have some friends who use this, and <laughs> I actually don't use it. <laughs> Uh, you use this as an app on your connected TV or your OTT device, and it pretty much gives you access to all TV and movie content ever. And some of it's legal, and you can go in and stream it, but a bunch of it is illegal. And so people are using it just like they started using Napster in 1999 and 2000, back when it was too hard to find music. There was no good way to actually pay for music, even if you wanted to. So to get an MP3, you would download it from Napster and share it with your friends and, and listen to that instead until iTunes came along and solved the problem and said, okay, you can buy a song for 99 cents. We have all the labels signed on. But that took years, and in the meantime, it, it destroyed billions of dollars of value for the music industry. The same thing is, is potentially happening with Kodi. This UI is way easier to use than scrolling through 10 different apps and trying to authenticate and find the TV show you want. It's free, it's not ad supported, it's largely pirated content and illegal, but they've solved the consumer problem. The punchline I would add to that is, in order for this to work, to get consumers not to adopt something like Kobe, we on the buy side in particular have to be willing to pay more for fewer, better targeted ads. Too often I think we go into conversations with agencies and marketers saying, okay, I want to pay less for this than I do on broadcast TV. That's the wrong answer. When it's addressable, when you can pick that I'm targeting the right audience, I'm targeting the right geo, I'm trying the right context, the time of day, all the variables going into the reason you want to buy that ad, you should be willing to pay more for it. That's what we see all the time in programmatic. On run of exchange and display, it's a $1 CPM. To buy in retargeting, people are typically bidding $5, $6 more. They're willing to pay 5X when they just know the user is someone they want. We need to be willing to do the same thing in connected TV in order for it to scale and also improve the consumer experience. Thank you guys so much for your time.